What if solar panels could generate twice the power for a fraction of the cost, making them cheap enough that everybody would want them on their roof? Well, researchers in Australia may have just pulled it off. This is a solar cell made with both perovskites and graphene, the record-breaking result of a collaboration between three Aussie teams, the Queensland University of Technology, or QUT, Halo Cell Energy, and First Graphene. This perovskite cell initially had an efficiency of 16.65%, which is well behind the 20% efficiency range that we're used to with standard silicon. The introduction of graphene almost doubled that initial figure to 30.6%, all while cutting production costs by an estimated 80%. So how is this possible? And more importantly, when might these actually end up on your roof? Well, perovskites have some pretty notable weaknesses, and graphene might be just the thing that perovskites need to move forward. The question is, is it feasible for the real world? Both perovskites and graphene have been overhyped for years and tricky to manufacture, let alone manufacture at scale. Can they really solve each other's problems or will the financial and engineering challenges just keep them benched? I'm Matt Farrell, welcome to Undecided. This video is brought to you by Ground News. First, let's back up. What are perovskites, what's graphene, and why should you care? We've covered perovskites plenty of times before, and I'll link to other videos in the description, so I'll keep this light and breezy. Perovskites are materials with crystal structures that lets electrons move freely. This makes them excellent solar absorbers, better than silicon, but they're fragile. UV rays, heat, and moisture all degrade them, which is a problem when solar panels need to last 20 to 30 years outdoors. Silicon, by contrast, is tough and proven. It's the solar standard for a good reason but it has a hard ceiling at around 30% efficiency. Perovskites can push past that if they can survive. Enter graphene. Again, I've touched on this in the past and I'm working on a deeper dive video coming up, so stay tuned for that. But graphene was discovered in 2004, which means it's barely old enough to legally drink here in the US. Despite its youth, it's strong, lightweight, and highly conductive. Researchers thought it would revolutionize everything. It hasn't mostly because it's hard to produce pure graphene at scale, but that's starting to change though. But here's the thing, graphene's toughness and water resistance can protect perovskites from moisture, and combining graphene's conductivity with perovskite's efficiency yields impressive results. If researchers can make this work, you're looking at solar panels that can pay for themselves in half the time, survive extreme weather better, and actually make financial sense for the average homeowner. They cover each other's weaknesses, Together, they enable manufacturing techniques like the industry standard roll-to-roll -roll processing that could actually make them viable. With that context in mind, let's take a closer look at that QUT Halo Cell First Graphene Triumvirate. The secret to their success is reportedly using First Graphene's Pure Graph product to add a layer to PVs that boost their conductivity. The team claims that replacing precious metals with graphene has allowed them to save up to 80% on material costs, Again, they maintain those costs while boosting efficiency to that 30.6% benchmark. Their graphene pellet additive is made from graphite ore that has a carbon content of over 98%. A proprietary method uses electrochemical exfoliation to produce graphene from graphite. This is already a popular graphene fabrication technique and it works by applying a voltage to graphite ore. This drives ions into the graphite layers and forces them apart, leaving us with ultra-thin graphene layers. The team claims that the process allows for graphite to graphene conversion rates above 95%. To put that into context, a conversion yield of 65 to 70% was considered highly efficient even just a few years back. This matters because graphene's strength has also been its weakness. It's so tough that integrating it into other systems has been notoriously difficult. If first graphene's process makes graphene easier to work with, that's as important as the efficiency gains. Proprietary processes always make me a little skeptical but I should mention that a 2021 paper in the Turkish Journal of Chemistry did briefly describe a very similar sounding electrochemical exfoliation method. This one uses a sodium hydroxide hydrogen peroxide water system that can make high quality graphene nanosheets with the same 95% yield figure. First, graphene could be using a similar process behind the scenes. Assuming that the claims are true, an 80% drop in material costs is nothing to sneeze at. It seems that all parties involved are very eager to get a competitively priced perovskite graphene PV on the market. Both Halo Cell's perovskites and First Graphene's Pure Graph are compatible with roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing techniques. Now, this is more or less the cheapest and easiest way to make a PV cell, which should help to further drop the costs. 
Halo Cell is currently in the process of seeking extra funds to expand its plant in Wagga Wagga, Australia. Waka waka. Earlier this year, the plant began producing commercial perovskite PVs, but not the graphene kind, for use in smaller IoT devices. That's not as exciting as full-blown PV modules, but it is a verifiable step towards commercialization. The company's goal is to eventually boost manufacturing up to about 60 million perovskite solar cell units annually. Australia isn't the only place researchers are working to commercialize a graphene perovskite wombo combo. Actually, if I had a nickel for every time three organizations recently started working together to commercialize graphene perovskite solar cells, <laughs> I'd have two nickels. But before I get to that second graphene perovskite solar cell, let me show you something about how we get information on these renewable energy advances. Depending on where you read about solar innovations, there are either revolutionary breakthroughs that will transform energy, or just another overhyped green tech bubble. When stories mix cutting edge science, billion dollar investments, and climate claims, how do you know if you're getting the full picture? That's where today's sponsor, Ground News, comes in. Created by a former NASA engineer, Ground News pulls from over 50,000 sources and breaks down political bias, credibility, ownership, and even financial incentives behind the coverage. A great example? Take any major story about renewable energy, like this one about renewables having surpassed coal globally. With one click, I can see a summary, political bias, ownership details, and a factuality breakdown for every outlet that's covering it. The center-leaning source keeps it straightforward with just the facts. The left-leaning headline brings in politics and highlights Trump's backing of fossil fuels. Meanwhile, one right-leaning source frames it as a question that's in doubt. Same story, three completely different narratives. If you're watching my channel, you probably like digging deeper into the science and technology behind these stories. Ground News helps you compare coverage, spot bias, and catch what others might miss. I especially like the blind spot feed. It shows stories underreported by one side of the spectrum. It's helped me recognize my own blind spots and understand the nuance behind the headlines. For a limited time, you can get the same plan I use for nearly half off. Just head to ground.news slash undecided or scan the QR code to save 40% off their Vantage plan. Thanks to Ground News and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now let's get back to the second graphene perovskite solar innovation. Swiss company Graph Energy Tech, or GET, is teaming up with Taiwan Perovskite Solar Corp, or TPSC, and the University of Cambridge. Luckily for me, they have a name for their collective. The Graphene Electrode Technology for Perovskite Solar Cells, or GET PSC. That's, I don't know if that's how they officially say it, it's how I'm gonna say it. GET PSC's approach differs from the Australian team a little bit. They're specifically working on swapping out the precious metal electrodes and perovskite cells with graphene. Solar cells typically rely on expensive silver electrodes. And this isn't ideal because silver is expensive and getting more expensive. It's expected to reach $50 an ounce in the next year. Since silver accounts for around 10 to 15% of your average PV module cost, eliminating it doesn't just help manufacturers, it directly affects what you pay at installation. Silver electrodes also degrade when in contact with perovskite components. On top of this, lab versions of PV cells tend to use gold in their electrodes for the best results, which isn't really viable for real-world applications. Graphene with its superconductivity and durability already works great as an anode. So if we can make graphene anodes affordably and at scale, then we can cut costs by a ton. Yet PSC is well aware of these difficulties in manufacturing graphene, but the team claims it's figured out a way to get around that. There aren't a lot of details, but whatever the method, GetPSE says its electrodes are compatible with scalable manufacturing methods like screen printing, slot die coating, and inkjet printing, enabling seamless integration within current solar cell production. This particular attempt to commercialize graphene perovskite cells has garnered some pretty significant funding from outside parties. Innovate UK, which is a British national R&D agency, recently awarded GetPSC a cool 884,000 pounds, or over $1.1 million. Saudi Arabian oil giant Aramco also has a hand on the ball. Last year, it invested 1 million pounds, or about $1.34 million, into the project. Graph Energy Tech's CEO, Thomas Baumler, has also mentioned that they're working on replacing silver electrodes in traditional silicon heterojunction PVs too. That could be an interesting area of study to revisit later. While we're mostly focusing on attempts to commercialize graphene perovskite PVs today, research in the field is still ongoing. Just last spring, a team of researchers from the East China University of Science and Technology, or ECUST, tackled perovskite's longevity issue with the aid of graphite. Part of the issue is that perovskites expand by around 1% when exposed to light. This doesn't sound like much, but repeatedly exposing perovskite to light day in and day out will eventually lead to failure through thermal and physical stresses. 
At best, that will cut into the efficiency or in the worst case scenario, cause outright structural failure. The ECUS team needed something ultra thin and ultra tough to protect perovskite from itself. Sounds like the perfect job for graphene. And indeed, they did develop a special graphene polymer armor for perovskites. The armor is transparent too, since we obviously don't want to interrupt the PVC process. Their tests showed that the graphene armor reduced the expansion rate down to 0.08%. That's from a tiny amount to next to nothing. But here's why that matters to you. Solar panels are an investment that needs to last 20 to 30 years to make financial sense. If Proskite panels degrade after just a few years, you're replacing them before they've paid for themselves. The graphene armor extended lifespan to 3,670 hours of continuous operation under simulated real-life conditions, and the cells were still running at 97% of their original efficiency when the testing stopped. The real challenge isn't just lab endurance, it's whether these cells can match silicon's proven 20 to 30 year performance in real world outdoor conditions. According to China Central Television, the ECUS team has begun pilot trials with industry partners. Unfortunately, the language barrier means that I'm struggling to find out how those pilot trials are going or who those industry partners might be. So if you happen to know, let me know in the comments. Clearly, perovskites are making incredible progress, and graphene is making incredible progress. Companies are putting a growing amount of time, effort, and capital into bringing these technologies to the market. It sure feels like it's a matter of time before graphene perovskite cells are in your hands. But I do want to pump the brakes. Despite the rapid advancement of these technologies, there's still some challenges that need to be addressed before you start seeing them on the store shelves, so to speak. First and foremost, longevity is still an issue. The various ways researchers have incorporated graphene into these cells is helping. However, helping is not solving. So while these cells made by QUT, Halo Cell, and the first graphene triumvirate are logging impressive lifespans of that 153-day testing, when you place that in context next to 20-plus year lifespans of silicon cells, you can see just how vast the gulf there is between how advanced these new cells are and good old silicon. While mass manufacturing sounds like it's more or less solved, the particularities of graphene and perovskites means that they're both still quite tricky to produce at the scale that you'd need for an affordable commercial product. Perovskite cells can theoretically be produced using simple coating processes, but achieving consistent quality and performance across large-scale production lines has proven difficult. It's the same with mass-producing graphene at the same specific high-quality grades needed for most of its applications. There's also a lot of hidden costs when it comes to manufacturing these technologies. Remember, graphene and perovskites are both kind of divas. While companies and universities are in fact successfully developing ways to mass produce them with commonplace fabrication techniques like roll-to-roll -roll processing, this doesn't eliminate the need to invest in things that will stop these materials from degrading before you're even done making the PV. Things like advanced barrier films and protective coatings are all needed to keep moisture, air, and light from messing things up. Plus, these are advanced materials. They require some measure of specialized training to manufacture. Advanced training isn't cheap, and it takes time. As we all know, time is money. These issues are all compounded by how young these technologies are. Graphene was only discovered in 2004. Again, it's barely old enough to drink. While perovskites have technically been around since the mid-1800s, the first working perovskite PV wasn't successfully fabricated until 2009. As far as my team and I could find, graphene and perovskites weren't combined until 2013. That means these technologies are very immature compared to silicon PVs, which have been commercially available since the 1950s. Plus, silicon works well enough. It's hitting its theoretical ceiling at about 30%, but researchers have found ways around that with multi-junction and tandem cells. That represents decades of innovation, optimization, and mass production that have all helped to bring down the cost of silicon PV. So despite the real and rapid improvements in both graphene and perovskite, Silicon has a multi-generational head start, and it may well take decades for graphene perovskite PVs to reach the kind of maturity and market penetration that silicon has. So where does that leave perovskite graphene cells? Looking at where the technology is right now, I'd have to say these fall on the lower end of the NASA technological readiness level, somewhere around a three or a five. We've seen some positive tests in simulated environments, especially from QUT, Halo Cell, and First Graphene. They're creeping up that scale pretty quickly, but there's no real way to tell when or if they'll make the leap to commercialization. That makes more sense when you look at the core pieces of the tech here. Perovskites have only just had their first commercial deployment last year, courtesy of Oxford PV. 
Then again, the technology has advanced pretty quickly in the last few years. I wouldn't be surprised if we check in next year to find it topped a rung or two on the TRL ladder. Graphene manufacturing used to be the major bottleneck, but the claims of these companies are proven, at least to the extent that it's now cheaper than the alternatives. This is reflected in the financial forecasts for graphene, which predict huge growth in the next three to eight years, with a predicted compound annual growth rate of 36.5%. The same thing is true for perovskites with a CAGR of 43.34%. So maybe we won't have to wait too long. If this tech lives up to even half of its promise, we could be looking at even cheaper, more efficient, and more sustainable solar panels down the road. That's worth being tentatively, patiently, cautiously excited about. But what do you think? Jump into the comments and let me know. You can also check out the extended cut of this video over on Patreon, where I go into a possible graphene alternative. And speaking of that, these videos take a team to make, a team of humans. Real research, real interviews, real feedback from experts, no AI slop. If that matters to you, Patreon support really helps a lot. The link is in the description if you'd like to join, but honestly, just watching like you are right now is awesome. Thank you. And check out my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll keep this conversation going. Keep your mind open, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.